Like we were one of maybe four uh, black guys at the conference. Like it's kind of like a Spider-Man moment. Like, why, why are we doing this? What like, and I, and I remember sitting in front of, and this happened at an event, so I had them in front of me. And I was like, do y'all think I willingly want to give away 50% of the money I make? Mm -hmm. I am making this decision because I know yeah. it is best for everyone here. Mm -hmm. My name is Paulina Reed, and I'm here with Carter Cofield and George Adjapong to talk about the origin story of Melanin Money and the reasons why they joined forces to create a community culture we just cannot get enough of. Okay. 2019, you're at a conference. You're awkwardly sticking out like a sore thumb, and you find each other. Tell me about your first encounter. Yeah, so we were, uh, I think it was like the lunch break of the conference and we were on our way to one of the restaurants that were nearby and pretty much all the people of color were walking pretty much to the same restaurant for the most part. We were like, all right, this is our one time to hang out. It's not all, all seven of us. Mm -hmm. And they were walking over. And then again, like we were one of maybe four uh, black guys at the conference. And then like, it's kind of like the Spider-Man moment. Like, you know, like, wait, <laughs> kind of cool looking. I said, cool. Um, and we it just kind of like connected. Uh, learn a little bit more about what he was doing, what I was doing. There's a lot of similarities. And they were like, yo, this is this is cool. This is rare. Not many times we get a chance to run into somebody that looks like you, has a similar vibe that's doing the same thing. Um, so we exchanged contact information and then just set the intention, like, yo, let's just stay connected. And then that evolved into us meeting every other Monday for two years straight. Wait, but you make it sound so smooth. And most, like, are you both extroverted? He's more extroverted than me for sure, but but I do but I can do it in business settings. But he's just naturally extroverted. Yeah, and the, what stuck out to me because um, first I, I mean I, I saw him I was like I don't know if he's cool, right? But like you know what I'm saying <laughs> I was like oh, let me see if he's actually cool. But what yeah. stuck out to me was we we're at the lunch table and he was like giving me all his secrets. Mm -hmm. Like he was well, the first yeah. yeah he was the first person I know that 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 I met at that stage that was just willing to just give me something and didn't expect anything in return. Yeah. So I think that was, that was unique. And um, cause in the world of crabs in the barrel, being from the South side of Chicago, yeah. it was like a aha moment that, oh, everybody did something like that. Mm -hmm. And so for, for me, that's why I was like, oh, we should definitely, we should definitely stay connected. Why every Monday for two years, like, what, like why that cadence? Why devote your time to someone you don't know? Well, at the time, you know, we didn't have a team. I think I was just about to get my first part-time assistant. You were completely solo for the most part, outside of just like people you've contracted to help you do certain things. And entrepreneurship can be very lonely, <laughs> right? And so when you find somebody in your same industry mm -hmm. who's, you know, doing it, because while we're in an industry that can, he's a CPA, I'm a, I'm a financial advisor. No, let's let's be honest. I guess it can be a little, little boring at times, a little antiquated. So we find someone who, seems like they're on a similar path than you. Uh, it just it just made sense. It was like, you know, like he said, I, I share secrets with him. He would come back and give me some game. And it felt like we almost had, had a partnership before we had a partnership, right? right? Somebody I could bounce ideas off with, celebrate wins with, you get a big client, that type of thing. And uh, we didn't, I don't think we set out with the intention that we knew it would be two years. Mm -hmm. It was like, well, let's just try to put it on the calendar let's so we can be consistent. And it just evolved to the point where when we formally became partners, like, I think just last year, we finally like, okay, we could take it off the calendar. We were in a place <laughs> with our actual meeting, but we could finally take it off the calendar. But it was hard because that was like a staple of what got us to yeah. like the next phase in business in their life. How did it contribute to the betterment of your businesses? Yeah, I don't, I don't think we would be here. Um, I mean, I think there's some distinct moments I can think about, right? So, I, so Carter has always been the, I'm gonna travel the world, I'm gonna take a month off. I'm a do I'm a do me type of thing, right? Which I respected about him. I think he created a business in that way, even when he had a service-based business. And so the pandemic hit, and I was like, bro, we gotta diversify. We gotta we gotta have some money in some other ways. And so I already had I had had the merch brand for years, but during the pandemic, I was like, all right, I gotta figure this thing out so that hopefully I can sell some stuff if my business goes up in flames and nobody wants to hire me for financial financial advisory stuff. And so I was just encouraging him, like, I was like, create a digital product, do something. Because he had a course in the past. I had a course in the past, but he had one in the past, and I don't think it sold that well. And he was pretty content with the business that he built. Like, I got freedom, I got autonomy. Um, why do I need to do this digital yeah. product thing? And then one thing I always admired about him is if I give him a play. Get out my he way. Go, he don't write. <laughs> Get out my way. He don't write. So I was like, bro, just trust me. Just yeah. trust me. He ran the play. 
Um, we ran the play so well that I pride myself on being great at marketing. But when I saw how well he was running the play, I was like, oh, we could probably collaborate in a more meaningful way and you could take the baton, right? Because I knew, okay, I got a wife. I knew we were family planning. I knew at some point I might not have the same desire or stamina to be like outside all the time, right? And I saw that he was not only willing, but able to do it in a meaningful way and take it farther than I could ever imagine. So for me, I mean, for sure, I think this business partnership would have existed without that season. Yeah, and I, and I, and I think that the two weeks, the every two week meeting for me was a reminder that I wasn't crazy. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any other entrepreneur friends that were like giving me confidence that what we were doing was working or on the right path, right? Oh, if all your friends are working, then you don't even have anybody to share um, these wins with these uh, these these tough um, entrepreneurial conversations. And like you say, it's lonely. So for me, those two weeks meetings were like refilling my entrepreneur cup. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs starting out don't have that. Mm -hmm. They have their employee cup and their entrepreneur cup, and more people are feeding their employee cup, which is like they, why why they end up going back to work. But this Monday meeting every for every two weeks was like refilling the cup of the hard weeks and the client saying no and just getting you to a place to take on the next two weeks of whatever entrepreneurship has to offer for that week. I was gonna ask about the empty cup. Tell me about a time when you confided in each other and what kind of support you offered each other. Hmm. That's a good one. You wanna go first? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, a time where we could find, I'm trying to think of like a non-business context. Um, I, dude, you gotta go first. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Fair. Um, actually, I can think of one. This is, again, she does it again by getting me to say something I never thought I'd, I'd say, say out loud. But last year uh, was a, I know this is the, the Millionaire Marathon campaign, but last year was an all out sprint. We did a podcast tour. We did uh, a sneaker ball event. We did an award show on top of all of our regular business activities, right? And it was great to, to test what we were capable of and the things we wanted to do, but it was, it was a stretch. Not to mention, obviously, I have a young son. I have a wife. And last year was very, was, was very challenging for, uh, for me and my, my, my household dynamics, right? Mm -hmm. To the point where, because Carter's my business partner, my wife was wondering, like, she's like, well, is, is, is your business partner influencing all these decisions about travel? About, and I, but I had to let her know, actually, no, really, it's like, I'm consciously making these decisions because I think this is where the business needs to go. But I was kind of losing sight of the fact that I needed to have a better pace and a better cadence, right? So at the time, I confided in him. I was just like, because again, you, you got to think about your marriage, your family is very sacred, right? You don't just yeah. tell anybody about challenges and turmoil you're experiencing. And so at the time, I was just like, Yo, bro, am I, am I tripping? Like, is this like a, is she like envious of my success? Like, I mean, we're going, like, I, I didn't know. I was, I was, because yeah. I was conflicted because I'm, I'm having the, the, the breakout year of my life, right? All of my dreams coming true, doing everything I could possibly imagine, taking clients to Jamaica, all sorts of stuff. But at home, we were having moments of, of friction, right? And so I confided in him to give him like, at least my perspective in terms of like what I thought was going on or what he thought. And, you know, he kind of helped me you know, unpack it and help me look at it from a different lens and a different angle so that I didn't jump to any assumptions or conclusions about, you know, the state of my, mm -hmm. my marriage. I'm happy to say now that we're in a great place, obviously, but last year was, it was tough, right? It was trying to juggle being a dad, trying to juggle being a husband, trying to juggle merging a company together, trying to juggle doing several different things that were the first, right? And, and trying to win at a high level. And it was tough. And I didn't know who I could, who I could talk to about it. And I confided in him. He gave me some good inside perspective to think about. I love that. that was good. You being a husband and a dad, mm -hmm. and you being a bachelor, how, how do you rectify the conflicts when you have to hold, hold it down at home mm -hmm. and maybe can't honor some of the business requests? And like, how do you reconcile within yourself, like, damn, like he got shit at home to do. Like we got this business to run. Like what does, what do those conversations look like? I love that question. So and I tell him this all the time. Like I respect him so much because he's able to run at the pace that I run at. He has a family. Mm 
Mm-hmm. I can do when I, what I want, <laughs> when I want, whenever I want. And I sit, I tell them sometimes that, bro, if you can't make something, if you can't come to this event, you can't, mm-hmm. like, I need you to have the, the, the wherewithal to let me know. Yeah. I'll go do it. But like, he never makes excuses on if we got to travel around the country, if we got to do something. So for me, he resets my minimum standard of business. Mm. I can never tell him I'm busy (laughs) because that would be a slap in the face. You know what I'm saying? Because he has has more going on than me. So I think that for me, he always resets my minimum standard of what busy is. And and just, I admire his dedication to the business because I know it's not easy because it's not easy for me. Mm. So I know it has to be, it has to be taxing on him and um, being the single bachelor, he, he keeps me in check from doing things I shouldn't be doing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because, you know, like, he, yeah. like he's, he's, seen, he's seen things that you I haven't while seen. out. Yeah. Like, he, like, pulls you yeah, back in. Exactly. <laughs> so it's a, <laughs> more than once. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a good dynamic to have because I think that it just, it just we balance each other out very well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well one, one thing I can say from this side of the perspective, because sometimes we look at life linear, like, as the progression. Like, you're single, then you're dating, then you're married, then you have yeah. a kid. Um, but one thing I think that he helped me out with is not losing my own identity and all that I have going on as a family, right? And being reminded like, oh, I should, because like last year this thing was salsa dancing. He was like, oh, I'm gonna go to salsa dancing. Oh, not salsa, was, was it salsa or Spanish? Or Spanish? No, oh. Sp- Spanish is this year, salsa. salsa. Yeah, last year. Yeah, so, but for <laughs> me, because I was so busy, I didn't, I didn't prioritize me. I did prioritize my son, I did prioritize my wife, I did prioritize the business, but I, I definitely ate last and I didn't get to do really anything for myself yeah. at all last year. So this year I made a commitment to myself to make sure I prioritize me. What's one thing that you've done for yourself this year? Focus on golf. Oh, yeah. are you good? Yeah, I'm pretty good. Yeah. That's awesome. I've been playing for a very long time, but the past couple of years because of business, I have just taken off a little bit, but yeah, I'm getting back in my bag. <laughs> most, I've heard that most business deals are done outside of the office. Would you say mm-hmm. on the golf course is like a great way to foster connection and relationships? A hundred percent, right? People's guards are down. They probably just hit a bad shot. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but no, it's, a, it's a great way to just connect outside of the, the four walls of, of yeah. the business for sure. So two successful men come together and combine companies. How do you navigate business challenges without allowing ego to get in the way? Mm -hmm. Has there been a time when your ego was put forth in front of the company's mission? What helps us the most is the fact that we're actually friends. Okay. And that was built over the Mondays gradually. Mm -hmm. Yes. If we were not friends before business, we would not be in business today. Um, Because when you when you love and care about somebody outside of dynamic of work, mm. that is where you are able to set aside your ego, right? That's where you're able to understand that to have the tough conversations, yeah. right? We are and we've had some really, <laughs> really tough conversations over the last year and a half. And if you're not comfortable and able to open up with somebody in those dynamics, then uh the business can't can't continue to grow at the rate that you want it to. So I think the fact that we're actually friends, the fact that we're actually willing to have tough conversations because before they become tougher conversations, mm-hmm. and um, we never let our personal egos supersede the vision that we have mm-hmm. for the business. Mm-hmm. Which are, those are these three things, in my opinion, that yeah. help us get through the tough times that we've had so far, you know? Yeah, uh, just to add to that, I would say, um, I live by this quote, uh, unarticulated expectations lead to premeditated resentments, mm-hmm. right? And so I think we do a very good job of, you know, having the, like, when you feel it, like, I think we both like have our own filter, like, let me, before I go to this person, let me at least try to process or digest what I think they're thinking or how, about it. And then, but pretty soon thereafter, we we come to each other, right? We don't let things fester. We don't let the energy get off. It's like, I know at the end of the day, he's my friend, he's my boy. I know at the end of the day, he means well for the vision of the business. So if I'm receiving or interpreting or feeling something that isn't in alignment with, with that, then maybe I'm misinterpreting something. Maybe that wasn't his intent or vice versa, right? So we have conversations and like, all right, well, this is how I see it. This is how I'm interpreting it. Is that what you meant? Like we have those honest conversations, right? Before jumping to conclusions and just really hearing another person out. I think the other big thing that's unspoken is we went into this business a, a, a mission first, not money first, right? Like 
we uh, started the podcast aspect of our business first and said, hey, look, we're not worried about a dollar from this. Like you're independently successful, I'm independently successful. Let's focus on building this so that we weren't putting unnecessary strain on the thing that we were building together, right? Because if we immediately needed the money, right, it would, I, I feel like that could have caused some strain. Like, yeah. yo, like, bro, what's up? Like, send me the wire, you know what I'm saying? But like, <laughs> we, um, we set the intention, like, no, it's like, I think it was another, almost another two years, right? So like two years, we just like figured out if we could even rock together. Then 2021 to 2023, we started the podcast in 2021. It was pretty much, all right, now let's see if we can do business together in a, in a, in a lighthearted way, which led us to eventually in 2023, evolving into saying, all right, we can really do this thing all in, right? So two years of just connecting, two years of starting the business and not taking anything from it. And then the moment we said it'll be going all in, we took off. On an operational level, uh -huh. did either of you come in with any non-negotiables? Because separately, you have your own business principles, the way you operate your business, the way you communicate to your clients. Like when you merged, what did that look like? And was it messy? Let's <laughs> <laughs> start that one. Um, my only non-negotiable was I wanted to see if we have to try, right? Mm -hmm. And and have that freedom. He he understood that. Um, but we came together like they were like. There were some things that we had to put in place to make sure that we all, uh, that the business flowed together. Because there were some systems I had, some systems that he had. And I think what we knew was that we had opposite expertise. So we had opposite mm -hmm. skill sets. So it was like, he's a phenomenal. That's the one thing you knew for sure. Like, 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 you're good at things I don't want to do. I'm good at things you don't want to do. Like, if we, yeah. if we can build on that, we have a good foundation. And so from an organization or structure, he's better. He's a better CEO than me. So like, you know, that, that, that's fine. Um, and he lets me run and market and do my thing. So like, I think that we knew each other's own genius and we kind of let that rock. But there was definitely some, some, some rocky things coming together. Yeah, I think that the way he put it when we first came together, we talk about leadership style, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I was more democratic. About it. <laughs> he was more of a dictator, right? So for me, I believed early on that you build the people, the people build the business. You empower the people. You show them what your vision is and, and what their roadmap is within that so that they can feel like they can grow with inside of the organization, right? And let people like to have more autonomy. He believed in, well, this is what needs to be done. I'm gonna give you the exact step by steps of what needs to happen. I'm gonna send it to you on Sunday. Here's your here's your checklist, right? Which I understood, right? And in hindsight, what we realized in in the, the, those leadership style variances is that some of the folks that I brought on had a little because of that autonomy were able to, you know, take a little bit more control for the things that they were doing. Whereas his people, some of his folks, like without that like guidance, if, he, if Carter's not there, then what do I do, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so we realized that that was kind of a benefit and organizational change we wanted to make across the board. Um, I think he he likes to definitely have fun. So I think that he's definitely influenced uh, some good aspects of the culture to know like, hey, we, 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 we work hard, but then we we play hard. Yeah. And I think people can appreciate that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, but I mean, it was I mean, I think any any merger, any consolidation is going to be tough. I think we've navigated it with grace considering the fact that we never had downtime. It was like we're merging and next week we have a uh, sneaker ball. And after that, we were taking our clients to Jamaica. Oh yeah, not for mention we have an award show at the end of the year. So I think considering all those factors, I think we navigated it and are continuing to navigate it with grace um, throughout the throughout the process. You can I give you a, a funny story yeah. that I love telling. Um, so um, we had like our, when our like main company meetings, right? Mm -hmm. And we, so it's like our, firm, our team just came together. And George told his team to do something. And they pushed back with their opinion. Mm. And I remember one of my employees texting me like, we can talk back like that? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, no, you can't. <laughs> but it was just, it was like in that moment, I realized like, oh, we're bringing two like mm -hmm. families together and putting them under the same households. We yeah. have to be cognizant on our leadership style. So they, they know it's one, it's yeah. one leadership style across the company. But that was, that was always hilarious. I, I remember that. That was funny. <laughs> okay. But I want to talk about client care because whenever a merger, a merger happens, mm -hmm. clients could feel like they're going to get less quality, mm -hmm. less attention. I don't know what's happening. How mm -hmm. did you communicate the new set of values and yeah. positioning and, um, the customer journey map after yeah. the merger? That's a great question. So, uh, again, we both come from financial services backgrounds. He has CPA firm. I, have, I still have wealth management firm. 
And when he started to take off in the digital kind of online space, he made a conscious decision of transitioning his book to another company, his, his firm aspect, right? And leaning all into more of the, the hybrid, like mastermind type environment, right? And so for me, I still have my firm. So the way we positioned it was now you still get the best, now you get the best of both worlds. You get the aspect of community and connection. And because with my firm, my clients never like cross pollinated, right? I just had a bunch of great people in silos. Yeah. With his format, everybody got to kind of congregate and connect. So now we, what we positioned it was, you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get the infrastructure and the support and the implementation of, of, a, of a wealth management firm while also getting the community and the connection of a mastermind, right? So people actually felt like they were getting more value add than less, right? To now know, oh man, if I'm on a certain level within the program, I can meet with an advisor one-on-one. Um, I get access to getting my estate plan. I get access to uh, life insurance. Like, so they all oh, get to implement all these things. Whereas before, we might have, you might have like, like brought people in to teach it. And if they wanted to on their own, maybe go out and work with those people that could, now all these things are a lot more streamlined and in-house. And so then, and then on my side, people are like, oh, great. Like, I get to go to Jamaica. I get to go to in Atlanta for a party. Like, so it was, it, I feel like it was, that part of it went well. I think there were aspects that were a little bit challenging in the beginning because anybody just would change just yeah. like, well, like, what does that look like? So we did have to navigate that in the beginning and just be overly intentional about communication and letting them know, like, hey, like, this is still the great program that, you, that you've always experienced. We're just adding value to it. Um, I think we did, we did have a little bit of a time to have to nurture, over-nurture. But I'm proud to say that now, like, it's, it's better than ever. And I was just telling him last night, after recording six podcasts, I had to teach 145 people, um, clients, which was one of our highest attended, highest attended webinars, considering the fact that we have, they have like multiple classes yeah. they can attend in a week. Yeah. And I think that like, so there was, a, I don't think I've told you this. There were a lot of pushback on my, I'm sure there was a lot. Like, who's like, this guy? Like, who is this like, guy? Why are we doing this? What like, yeah. and I, and I remember sitting in front of, and this happened at an event. So I had them in front of me mm -hmm. and I was like, do y'all think I willingly want to give away 50% of the money I'm making. Mm -hmm. I am making this decision because I know yeah. it is best for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm, you know, taking a hit because I know in the greater scheme of things, mm -hmm. this is going to be better for everybody. And I think once you give somebody perspective, once you, everybody fears change yeah. because of like what it was before. So I think, but once you give somebody perspective, like this is what's going to be best for all of us. And if you just trust me on this change, you, you will come out on, on the better side of it. Um, I think that we were extremely open and authentic yeah. with, our, with our clients and letting them know like, hey, like, this is probably gonna be a lot, but if we didn't think it was best for y'all, we wouldn't be doing this right now. I love that. Talk to me about the significance of community engagement in achieving your goals as a company. And what is your unique approach to creating um, uh, community culture that people mm -hmm. just can't get enough of. One thing I will say, like a quick observation of your social channels is that your, your tribe shows up for you in a big way, but how was that cultivated? How did you go from, you know, merging communities to now like people showing up in droves? Yeah, yeah. So I learned, one of my college professors um, in marketing, he, he said that people will do more for recognition than they will for money. But he said, in marketing, most, most of that's used as an exploitative tactic, right? It's like, how can I leverage this to get somebody to buy something? I said, well, I wonder if I can flip that ideology on its head and use it for good, right? So hence uh, the Melanin Money Awards, right? So now we have you know, this, this platform and this initiative where people are now getting celebrated for things they typically don't get celebrated for, right? It's like, hey, congratulations on fully funding your IRA. Congratulations on achieving your first 100,000 in net worth. And here's a tangible award and people, you know, unboxing it on, online, not because you spent money, but because you actually kept it and retained it. Yeah. And so I think people are really galvanizing around that, I, that idea because I, I remember like talking to like some of our strategic partners, you know, like, wait, people are willingly sharing their net worth. Are you sure that's gonna work? I was like, I don't know. I was like, I believe it will. <laughs> Um, and I think like that in and of itself is really, is really different because most people are, that's, aren't really transparent about like where they are in their wealth building journey. Um, so I think that's something that really has people excited. Um, it's really creating a tribe around that. Um, outside of that, I think the fact that when we think about like a traditional educational platform or wealth building platform, it's a lot of information, but it's not a lot of implementation. Mm -hmm. Right. What makes ours different is we have the infrastructure in place that, like I said earlier, 
you, you when you're in this program, you're going to get your a, a trust and estate plan. You're going to get your life insurance. You're going to get your cash flow plan, your financial plan. You're going to get your investment account set up. You're going to get your tax plan and tax strategy all of, uh, as a part of our program, right? Like people can join and walk away knowing that this isn't just a rah-rah session or me right. just, you know, getting excited to hear hear more, you know, Instagram sound bites, right? I actually am going to be able to implement something that's going to be transformative for my family. So I think because of those factors, that's what I think. And I think the name, like, like, like people can only get behind Carter Cofield for so long. People can right. only get behind George Atchafall for so long. But Melon and Money becoming a Melon and Millionaire, yeah. like, it means something It deeper. means something deeper to them than just getting behind two guys. The, the company, I give them credit for this all the time. Like the company's mission mm. is what's allowing us to like galvanize people to be, whether it's by buying the merchandise to understand that I am a future melanin millionaire, right? I think the, 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 the name and the strength of the messaging for the company really gives people hope inspiration and something to aspire to become because our whole thing is like we don't want melanin millionaires to be something that only a few people attain. like we want I mean, like we want that to be average like oh yeah like like black millionaire that's, that's the thing that right. that's normal now mm -hmm. right so um we have it, what shirt that says normalized black look and like every time i wear it people are like yo because it should be normal Right. Why does it have this taken us so long for it to become normal? And we're trying to push the narrative to make it a normal. Mm -hmm. What challenges come along with building community? Because it's not all rainbows and sunshine. People have complaints. Mm -hmm. People, people sometimes do not take advantage of what's presented to them, and then will file oh, a complaint God. or file. Talk a about it. <laughs> right. Talk I want to know. It. You know, have you received any public scrutiny? Like, tell me about some of the challenges that come along with building the community. Yeah, um, we definitely have received some internal. I think. I think we almost have so much value, right? That like some people, if they don't like get in and pick a path, they can be like, "Oh, I'm overwhelmed." It's like so much information, um, and also like the fact that there's varying levels of entry points, right? There could be somebody in here who's like, "Yo, I already got the money. I just." I'm tired of paying too much in taxes. And, and there's somebody who's like, oh, I'm just kind of getting started, right? So I think there, there's challenges with having such a dynamic community, right? It's not like we're only focused on high net worth people who already got it and we're trying to get you from half a million to a million, right? We have a full spectrum within our ecosystem. So that can be challenging. People coming in feeling intimidated by you know certain people, feeling like certain concepts might be above their head, I think it could be intimidating. But I think we are doing our best to over deliver in, in terms of just like Q and A, like, hey, look, if you don't do nothing else, if you don't open a course, attend a class, meet with your, like, come to our Q and A's, right? Where you can ask your specific question yeah, and, and we can help you. People, and and people you know. also just like to be around other people who are dealing with the same issue. 100%, which is why we're so big on uh, our events, yeah. right? So like we have uh, two like core events that are part of like our, our higher level program and one event that's like um, it's kind of available to them and the general public, which is Wealth Weekend. And we want to give them a chance to like, hey, like come in, like build community. Like we know that your group chat is talking about Diddy and everything else, else that's going on in the world. Like, but we're talking about building wealth, right? We're talking about helping you navigate your business. And so just encouraging them to continue to stay immersed in the community. Um, and to come to the live events. I think that's, that's been helpful. But it, there's definitely been some you know, challenges along the way just to get people to take advantage of what you pay for. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I think we, we've tried to make it comprehensive because what I learned is that don't put your reasons on why somebody joined on them. And you don't know why they joined. Some people join a program for education. Right. They get that. Some people join a program just to be around other people. So we have an amazing community. Some people join a program for accountability. Mm -hmm. We give them accountability, right? Some people join programs for experiences. Mm -hmm. We give them phenomenal experiences. So we've taken the time to say, hey, why do people join programs? Mm -hmm. And can we achieve success at a high level on every reason why somebody would join? So whether you join it for education, access, community, environment, experiences, you get all that here. So trying to make it a cohesive community. So far, it's worked really well. We have an amazing customer service team that takes care of people as well. Cool. In light of the reports found online that speak to the projected decline of black wealth, um, like what are some of the trends, conversations, statistics mm -hmm. that have been alarming to y'all over the last few years that have really prompted you to pursue this mission? 
Yeah, so um, the merchandise side of the brand, I launched back in 2017 for that very reason. Um, I was like, I think the stat at the time, there was a, a report that came out at the time that was like black wealth net worth is going to zero by 2052 mm -hmm. or something like that. And I was like, hmm, I mean, I got all, pretty much all my clients are people of color. I don't believe that. I thought I was like, I need, need to change this narrative. And so at the time I thought changing the narrative was creating conversations. Well, I didn't want to spend money on building a billboard so I was, or paying for billboards. So let's put messages on shirts that can spark those conversations. And that's all I wanted to do. I didn't expect to make money from it. I expected it just to be a, a catalyst to spark conversations and ultimately maybe get some clients, maybe, you know, listen to a podcast or whatever, right? Um, it started to take on its own identity. And people started to think that this was my main thing. Like, yo, what's, what's up with them shirts? I'm like, bro, I don't care about the shirt. Uh, but because of that, I had to put more intention and more energy around the melon and money, create more of a mission around it. And at the time, the mission was to help uh, 100,000 people invest their first $1,000, something like that, right? And it was happening. I was like, oh, shoot, like people like really invested. But so what, what that let me know, though, is that it was too small, mm. right? Not the amount of people we wanted to impact, but the threshold. So I was like, all right, instead of it being investing your first thousand, how about helping them achieve their first one million in net worth, which would then decrease the wealth gap by $100 billion, right? And that's a goal that is so big that, I mean, I don't know the, the actual finish line, but I know that we're putting in the infrastructure in place. So whether me and Carter are able to get it across the threshold or the next people that come behind us to carry the torch, uh, that can, can get us across the threshold. But ultimately I know it's big enough to have an impact and change that narrative. Um, and we're proud to say that just last year alone, we helped our community improve their collective net worth by $60 million in 2023. What are some of the like metrics? Like how do you, how do you measure success within the company? Yeah, um, I would say, uh, so that, that's one of the big North Stars is how are we collectively Im improving the net worth of our, of our community, right? That's one. Mm -hmm. um, Another one, obviously, we measure all of the like the micro ones, like how much money have they maxed out their their IRA and their 401k and things of that nature. Um, he's a, a tax saving guru, so we are measuring like how much money have we helped people save in taxes, because ultimately that's more money they can use to to build wealth. Those are key markers of success. Um, also, people who have the desire to be full time entrepreneurs, how do people have been able to come in our program and ultimately, you know, leave their nine to five completely is a marker of success. Um, and then I would also say from a life insurance standpoint, because, um, you know, that's one of the easiest ways to secure your, you know, financial legacy. Um, so we're always tracking and measuring how many people have enforced um, policies. And I think last year was like 100 million or something crazy like that. Um, those, those are a few of them. Yeah. You talked about 1 million in net worth. What's the significance of that number? In my opinion, it's relatively easy to get to six figures, but people really struggle to get to from six to seven figures. Yeah. So why a million in net worth? Like, why is that the target? Yeah. So I think one is the difference between make a, earning money and having a net worth. Okay. So you can make you can earn a million dollars, right. but that doesn't mean you're going to have a net worth. Correct. Dollars, right. So what I think, why well, I think the mission is so different is because. We're teaching people not just to make money, but to preserve and multiply mm -hmm. the money, right? Because we know millionaires that spend uh, a million and a half, right? <laughs> and that, yeah. that they in the red. So we're like, you know, you know it's a lot of programs teaching people how to make a hundred thousand, how to right. make a million. But we didn't see any other program teaching them how to preserve, mm -hmm. protect, and multiply mm -hmm. that that million to actually have that net worth. Because in my opinion, like if you have a million dollars in net worth, you can stop working. Yeah. Like. That's financial freedom. If you make 10% a year of your money, that's $100,000 a year that right. you, you, know, you, know, that you can live off of. But then that, that will keep multiplying. So like, I think the reason why the number is where it is is because that is financial freedom. Mm -hmm. If you have a million dollars in net worth, you can choose to work or you can choose not to work depending on how much money you want to spend a year. But financial freedom is having the freedom of choice to work around. Mm -hmm. right. And we feel like that number will give people that freedom. Yeah. yeah. It's that, it's that first like baseline where it's like, it's, it's truly tangible mm -hmm. and there's enough resources and just depending upon your lifestyle will determine, all right, do I need 1.5 or am okay. I good with where I'm at? At what mm -hmm. age did each of you achieve your first million in net worth and what were the contributing factors that got you there? That's a great question. For me, it was 32. Mm -hmm. um, and the contributing factors was like, he'll tell you, like, I'm, I'm actually a pretty frugal guy. That is, um, a, he is extremely, <laughs> uh, extremely frugal. 
Yeah. It makes no sense sometimes. Uh, yeah, I'm, conserv I'm, I'm conservative, <laughs> right? Let's say that. Um, and so the contributing factors, mm -hmm. as fundamental as it sounds, is I just kept my, my highs low and my lows high. And what I mean by that is early in entrepreneurship, tons of ebbs and flows, right? It's like, you know, one month you can make 40,000, one month you can make $40, right? Um, but I always, my lifestyle expenses didn't adjust based upon the money that I was making, right? And for that reason, it allowed me, as I started making more money, to continue to have more disposable income uh, to be able to tuck money away for investments, right? For example, one of the metrics you talked about, like metrics of success, one of our metrics is how much of your income is allocated, can you allocate for saving and investing, right? You always hear about 10% as a baseline. But my goals, I want to have more, a higher percentage of my income allocated towards investing than I do actually living, right? So I want 60% of my income allocated towards building wealth, right? And for that reason, I was able to hit that target. Not doing anything special, but just keeping my lifestyle expenses low and allocating more money towards investing in the stock market. Oh. Yeah. Hang with him, help me. <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, like, and I was always diligent with my money, but there are levels of diligence, yeah. right? Like. 60%. I'm like, if I say 25, like, <laughs> I'm good. Spend the 75, bro. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Um, so I think I hit mine at 29. Mm -hmm. And one thing he always says, and that's why, that's why I love him for this. He says, if you're not doing better than me by the time you get to a certain age, I'll fail you as a friend and a business mm -hmm. partner. Right? So because he's a few years older than me, he always like, like, bro, if I hit it by then, you should hit it way before then. So mm -hmm. I think I hit mine at, at uh, right before my 30th birthday. And having a million dollars in net worth felt better than making a million dollars a year. Because it's, it's there, it's tangible. Like, you can walk away from all this and be like, yo, I'm good. Yeah. Like, and when work becomes optional, you really only work on things that you really love doing. Mm -hmm. And when you work on things that you love doing, it makes you extremely uh, more successful in business because you're focusing on your zone of genius. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to say, like, you don't have to say yes to the client that you know is against your morals and values. Right. You don't have to bite that bullet. You right. need to say no, because there are thousands of other people that you want to work with. And that's why within the company, we don't, we don't have to say yes to people who we don't want to say yes to. Right. It gives us the freedom and autonomy to, to, back to your point, we would never let somebody in our community who's not a good fit because they would destroy the community. But like having that, that, that financial freedom number gives us the ability, access, and um, uh, opportunity to operate in our zone, zones of genius and what we love to do. Good. Walk me through what it means to have a wealth health assessment. Mm -hmm. What are questions that you prompt your clients to answer? Mm -hmm. What are some of the inner work that they need to do before they can really accelerate in their finances? Yeah. So what we realize is there's a, there are a lot of parallels um, between your physical health, right? And also uh, your financial health, right? And so some of the questions we wanted to have like kind of an objective way to measure where people were in their, their journey, right? Um, and so some of the questions that we ask are fundamental uh, aspects that we think people should have addressed in order to be completely financially holistic. So for example, um, we might ask, you know, do you have disability insurance, right? Which is an outlier for some people because it's like, hmm, um, I think I do. Maybe I have it through work, but people don't realize it, you're actually three times more likely to become temporarily disabled in your working years than you are to die prematurely. So if you don't have that, then that means that if you get hurt or sick and can't work, you might not be receiving any income, right? So do I have that, right? Do I have life insurance? Do I have an estate plan so that I say I want to build generational wealth, but I don't even have a generational wealth plan? Um, for entrepreneurs, we're asking them, do they have a succession plan? Like, have you thought about what does it look like to transition this business, whether I'm transitioning to leadership or I want to sell it? Because these are the things that you have to answer if you actually want to be free. Because again, you can have a million dollar business and not be free. Yeah. You can make a million dollars and not be free, right? Because the one thing I always say, is rich people do the right things, wealthy people own the right things, right? Like you're smart, he's smart, I'm smart. We can probably always go out and use our skill set to make more money, but if we get hurt or sick or tired or whatever, then who, what's making the money for us, right? So the wealth health assessment is designed to extract, uh, are you protected in your journey? Um, are you building wealth and investing in your journey? And do you have a framework to preserve and pass this wealth on to the people that you say you care about? Oh. Is there a story behind the name, Melanin Money? 
<laughs> kind of. Um, so as you know, um, I had an extensive surgery in 2016 and I couldn't really sleep in, in that season, right? Actually, to the point I had to get a recliner. Um, I actually just posted about it for the first time a couple weeks ago. Um, I had to get a recliner that I was just kind of just sit up in. It's like the only thing I could get some kind of like rest. Like I couldn't really sleep. Um, and so I was like in this season of like being kind of out of it, not being able to do my entrepreneur thing. I was like, man, I got to find some way to make some money. Like if it doesn't depend upon me, I was like, and that's when I started, my juices started flowing with the merchandise and, and, and all that jazz. And where the name came from was, I was like, I'm a financial advisor, so I deal with money. I want to help people that look like me. And then I kind of like just was spitballing some ideas. And, yeah. and then it just came together, I was like, don't let the money. Don't let them go, daddy. <laughs> I was like, no way. <laughs> and it was available. I said, God, appreciate you. <laughs> Got the domain, trademarked it shortly thereafter. And, and it, it just was the, the best of both worlds of what I wanted to do. I wanted to help people that look like me mm -hmm. with their money. And after a few iterations, the name came to me and it's one of the, one of the best, best things I ever did. Yeah, he, passed, he just told me that, I said, you got, you, you got that? I said, I, I need in I need on that. <laughs> I was like, I ain't gonna hold you, I, I need in on that. But like, no, I, I can't believe that he was able to come up with that name that it was still available. Yeah. Cause again, it's so, so easy for people to galvanize behind cause like they can see themselves within the mission. Yeah, absolutely. Both of your journeys signify that life is a marathon, not a sprint. Tell me about the campaign. Yeah, so, and I'll give, like, he, I am a implementer, right? Mm -hmm. You tell me where to go, I'm a run. This man wakes up in the middle of his- With ideas. With middle of the night with ideas. Hey bro, I got another one. I got another one, so I, I, will, be, I will be remiss if I didn't let him explain uh, this, this idea that I think is good. Yeah, um, so the, the millionaire marathon, right? Like, to your point, to a lot of people, that millionaire status seems like, oh, it seems out of reach, right? And it's the same way to a lot of people, including myself, running a marathon could seem out of reach. And so uh, a thousand mile journey starts with one step. And so like letting people know that, hey, look, you might see a Carter online, you might see a George online, you might see a Paulino online. Yes, we maybe have re are getting closer towards the end of our marathon, right? But we didn't start there, right? And you have to run your race at your pace and just empowering people to know that regardless of where you are in your journey, it's meaningful, right? It should not be overlooked. It's significant and you can start where you are and that's okay, yeah. right? Um, and just in understanding this, like every, Rome wasn't built in a day. We actually like literally this week had a revelation because we have some big goals, obviously audacious goals with our business and the people that we want to impact, impact. And we realized that there is no unreasonable goals. There's sometimes just unreasonable timelines. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those timelines are expedited by paying attention to other people's highlight reels and you not having the full context to what it took, what it took to get to that journey, right? So um, that's kind of the overall inspiration for the campaign is letting people know that, hey, take your wealth health assessment. Maybe you have a 50, maybe you have an 80. Regardless of where you are, that is your, you now know your starting point and you can run your race at your pace. Yeah, and I think um, one thing that we never want to lose sight of is we don't want to like lose sight of what's actually happening in the world. We do understand that 70% of people don't have $1,000 saved in their mm -hmm. bank accounts. And we don't want them to hear melanin money or becoming a melanin millionaire. Like, well, that's for people who already have money, right? right? So like, I think it's so, when he brought me that idea, I'm like, it's so brilliant because now we're able to encapsulate everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you want right. to walk the race, whether you want to jog <laughs> the race, look, yeah. like however you want to, however you want to run the race, like put your blinders on, mm -hmm. just like the horse in the Kentucky, Kentucky Derby, put your blinders on and run your race. Don't look left, don't look right. All you're focused on is that finish line that you have the ability to make it to as long as you stop, like, don't continuously compare yourself to other people who you don't even know. They might not start at the same start line as you. Right. They might have started halfway through, cut through the little rope and just start getting the race, but <laughs> you need to understand that if you run at your own pace and you run the race and you don't quit, mm -hmm. You can always fit. So, my last question: How do you stay grounded amidst the pressures that come with success and wealth? Yeah, how do you stay grounded? Um, I think number one by sharing it with the people that you love, right? Using your money for meaningful things. Like again, I'm part of my frugality is is just that like stuff doesn't really motivate me. Like I might buy a nice watch because I really want the watch, not because I think someone's gonna see it and be like, "Oh, you a Rolex guy," right? Um, so for me, it's, it's using your resources 
that, that align with what you say you value, right? So for example, like a couple few weeks ago, I took my mom to a Lakers game. She's never been to LA. She's a huge LeBron fan. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't know until a week ago, or like a, well, a month ago, that she never f- flew first class. I was like, wait, I didn't know that. Cause you just don't know these things, right? Cause like, I just started, I mean, not a few years ago. So it's like, I didn't really think about the fact that maybe she had never done it. And so I, she, she mentioned it and I was able to use my resources to do something that's actually, that I actually care about versus using my resources to, to keep up her persona or flex or stun on somebody, right? right? It's like using my resource, because that keeps me grounded because I know regardless of what your perception is of me, I know that I'm not using my money for anything other than to better my life, leave a legacy for my son, uh, for my family, and take care of the people that I, that I love. So for me, that, that helps me stay grounded. Um, as it relates to our team and our clients that we serve, looking at the results that they get, right? So sometimes it's hard, right? It's the pressure of like building this infrastructure. I just want to chill. I don't want to do all these things all the time. But when you realize that your obedience is tied to somebody else's destiny and that it's working, you have almost an obligation, yeah. right? To, to keep going. So those are the things that keep me grounded. Wonderful. Yeah, my mentor taught me um, to never use the people and love the money. Mm-hmm. He said instead, love the people and use the money. He said, I want to take it a step further, use the money to love the people. Mm-hmm. So like to Georgia's point, like I set aside a percentage of my money every single month that I earn to give to people in other instances, but that share needs, my family, not profits, whatever, because I learned that the only feeling better than making money is giving it away to people who need it more. Right. So if you continue to do that and you get that feeling of giving, well, guess what? I need to go make some more money so I can go give some more money. Mm-hmm. So there will never be a point of like, I made enough money because there are still people that need help. And if I can continue making money and, give, and giving money to cause that I care about, that's where my motivation comes from. So that's, I think that's how you stay grounded. I love what you built. It seems as if that you have built a phenomenal empire with integrity and with a lot of heart. And I think viewers are gonna really appreciate your transparency. This is a side to y'all that no one has ever seen. (laughs) For sure, yeah. (laughs) And um, I'm honored to be a part of this ride. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you.